to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who trust in Him. Nahum chapter 1, verse number 7. Welcome to our study of the minor prophets of the Old Testament. On today's lesson, we're going to be talking about several of the minor prophets that are smaller in size, but have lessons that are very practical and applicable to Christians today. Of course, today's program is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. They'd love for you to stop by in your area and visit the Church of Christ. This program is overseen by the Central Church of Christ in McMinnville, Tennessee. And as always, we want you to know that all of our material is online and can be accessed free of charge at thegospelofchrist.com. If you've got a Bible study question or you'd like to study the Word of God further, we'd love to help you with that. Please contact us at the end of this program concerning our help in Bible study and how you might come to a greater knowledge of God's Word through some of the free materials that we have available. The book of Nahum is kind of an update on what happened to the people in the book of Jonah. You remember Jonah? Jonah went into the city of, uh, to the region of Assyria, to Nineveh, the capital city, preached that God's judgment was coming. Those people responded powerfully to that message, and yet 125 years later, they're back in the same rut again. And so God's message through the prophet Nahum is to the people of Assyria who now have fallen back into sin and it is a message of judgment and that God promises He's going to bring the city to an utter end and destroy these wicked people. What do we know about God and His relationship with these people and, and what can I learn practically from the book of Nahum? that will help us in studying the Word of God and, and who God is. Well, first, we learn this about God, that God does not acquit evil people. Look at Nahum chapter 1, verse number 3. The Scripture says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. What's God like? Is God an angry God? No, the, the Lord is slow to anger. God doesn't want people to go to hell. In fact, the Bible says God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. The Lord's not slow concerning His promises as some men count slowness. Rather, He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. And so, 125 years later, God's fed up with the Ninevites and the Syrians and their ungodly behavior again. And so he says, the Lord's slow to anger. He's been patient with you. He's great in power as He's shown you. But God will not at all acquit the wicked. Friend, jo the message here, different from the book of Jonah, is now that God has had enough of the people's sins and they're not going to be able to escape. Could they change? Absolutely. Does God want that? You bet He does. But it's a message where God will not acquit evil people. Friend, there's a very practical lesson and it's this. If one practices sin and lives in sin and does not change that sin in his life, there won't be any escaping on the day of judgment. Now, don't get me wrong. Can people repent, be forgiven, that be held against them no more? Absolutely. Hebrews 8 verse 12, God says, I'll be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. And so, yes, the past can be erased, but if we live in sin and die in sin, we're not going to hear on the day of judgment, well, you've done wrong, live wrong, but... 
come on into heaven. That's not, not the idea that we find throughout the Scriptures. What else do we learn from the book of Nahum that encourages and, and helps Christians to really be what God wants them to be? We learn that God is our stronghold. God is good. Listen to Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 again. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who trust in Him. What a powerful message of hope and encouragement found in the book of Nahum. Much like Psalm 46 verses 1 and 2, the Lord is our stronghold. He's that place we can run to. He's the rock that will not shift or change when so many things do. As we think about Nahum and how we want to be more like God's people and less like the Assyrians, we learn that there is no escape from the wrath of God. Is God, did God promise to punish the Assyrians? Absolutely. Did it happen? You bet it did. 606 under the hand of Nabopolassar through the Chaldeans, God punished. Assyria, and they were ultimately destroyed. History reveals that. And so, just as God promised it, it came true. Friend, God's promised there's a day of reward and there's a day of judgment coming. For those who have done good, they can hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Those who have done evil, there will be a day of recompense coming and it will be a very sad day. Let's then turn our attention for just a moment to the book of Habakkuk. What is Habakkuk all about? Well, Habakkuk has that one of those verses or one of those phrases that you find repeated multiple times throughout the New Testament. Found in Habakkuk 2 verse 4, we have that phrase, the just shall live by faith. That's the origin of that phrase is in the book of Habakkuk. Well, what's going on here? God's enemies, now the Chaldeans, are reaping havoc on God's people. They're living ungodly. They've got their idols. They're worshiping in a way that's not acceptable to God. And so God says to His people, you remain faithful. You live righteous. You trust in Me. I'm going to take care of the rest. It's a great lesson about trust and hope and faith in Almighty God and His truth. Let's make the book, or let's see how the book of Habakkuk is so practical toward us today. One of the great lessons that we learn in Habakkuk is about the purity and majesty of God. Notice Habakkuk chapter 1, verse number 13. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a, more, a person more righteous than he? God is pure. Uh, he's holy. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 44 repeated in 1 Peter 1 verse 15. Be holy for He is holy. God Himself is the essence of holiness. And we learn a lot about how that means God will relate to mankind. God cannot look upon that which is sinful. He's of pure eyes than to behold iniquity. What's that mean? If people are living in sin, blatant sin, rebellion, I've got sin in my life, you've got sin in your life, can I be in a relationship with God? He's of pure eyes than behold evil. He cannot look upon wickedness. Sin does separate a man from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. And so inherent in that idea is if God wants man to be saved and he's of pure eyes than to behold iniquity or sin, sin cannot be found with God, there has to be a sacrifice. The shedding of blood. Hebrews 9 verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. We see Jesus, Hebrews 2 verse 9, was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that He by the grace of God might taste death for every man. If God's pure and man has sin, what's going to bring them together? He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. 1 Peter 2, verse number 24. 
Now, for just a moment, let's turn our attention to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 2, and I want you to notice that God here emphasizes His message, His truth, must be made plain. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets. Now, how plain that he who runs may read it. How plain, simple is God's truth. God said, I want you to write it on tablets. I want you to make it plain. And here's how plain I want you to make it, Habakkuk, that he who runs may read it. Now, here's, the, here's what I think of when I think about Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. You're in your car and you're on the interstate and you're driving 70 miles an hour down the interstate and a billboard's in the, in the distance. How plain is that billboard? Well, they've made it so plain, so succinct, so simple, so big, so bold, that even driving 70 miles an hour down the interstate, you can't miss the message. Friend, that's the point here. Make it so plain that even if somebody's running, they can still get the message. God's truth is simple. When you read, you can understand it. Ephesians 3 verse 4. That's why we want to preach the Word of God. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. That's why we want to speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4 11. This is why we want to encourage people to study the Bible for themselves. Acts chapter 17 verse 11. God's truth can equip us for every good work. It has everything for life and godliness. 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17, and 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. Now, for just a moment, as we think about the book of Habakkuk and some of its messages, I want you to turn to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, and notice the majesty and holiness of God. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. When I think of God, when we think of His magnificence and His splendor, we see passages like in Ezekiel chapter 1, like in the book of Daniel, and like in the Revelation, in the revelation of Jesus Christ toward the close of the New Testament, where God is enthroned. He's in heaven in His majesty, His power, His person. Who is that? Well, the Lord's in His holy temple. How should the earth respond? In view of the majesty and the power and the all that God ought to inspire. Let all the earth keep silent. What's that mean? God's God. We're His creation. Let's let Him do the speaking. Let's do the listening. Let's let God be God and let's submit ourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. Verse Peter 5 verses 6 through 8 and James chapter 4 verses 6 through 8 as well. When we think about God, Let's let His goodness, His holiness, and His character be that which motivates and strengthens us every day to really live the way God wants us to live. Now let's turn our attention for just a moment to the book of Zephaniah. What is Zephaniah all about? It's one of the less known minor prophets and it contains a, a very powerful message about God. Zephaniah is a reminder to God's people of both God's love and His anger. How that He longingly desires for His people to be faithful and live faithful to Him and how if they don't. God is a God who does at times get angry and He wants them to be what He wants them to be. Look in Zephaniah chapter 2 and I want you to notice the encouragement found in verse number 3. The scripture says, Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth who have upheld His justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. What's Zephaniah about? It's encouragement for God's people to seek God, seek His truth, put Him first, and in the day of His anger, God will provide a way of escape. Oh, it's a great message about putting our trust where it needs to be. Isn't this what Christians are to do? Do you remember Jesus' words in Matthew 6, 33? Seek first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33, Jesus clearly taught us about putting first things first. Paul said, for to me, to live is Christ 
and to die is gain. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 21. Now, why did the people need to hear this in the book of Zephaniah? Well, like today, people were putting their trust in the wrong things. God clearly says to the people, your materialism, your worldliness, uh, the things you think you've got going for you, they can't save you in the day of judgment. Look at Zephaniah chapter 1, verse number 18. God says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of His jealousy, for He will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. What about all these nations who have got their silver idols and their gold idols and all the money and wealth and materialism? Are, is that going to save them in the day of judgment? God says, no. Neither their silver nor their gold can save them. Our money, our own might, our own power can't save us. The love of money, Paul said, it's a root of all kind of evil. We know in Colossians 3 verse 5 that materialism is a form of idolatry. And we know the Bible clearly says that we cannot be saved from aimless conduct like gold or silver by tradition of the fathers. Rather, it's with the precious blood of Jesus. 1 Peter 1 verses 18 through 20. And so where are we putting our trust? Where are we putting our hope? And, and what do we really know that God is going to do to help His people on the final day? You know, one of the things we learn in the book of Zephaniah is, and it's good news, God will intervene for His people. Look in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse number 7. The Bible says, The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed their flocks there. In the houses of Ashkelon they shall lie down at evening. Watch this. For the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. Is there good news among these minor prophet messages where there is much doom and destruction? You bet there is. And this is one of the most powerful. God's willing and able to intervene for His people and to return the captives. If we trust in God, if I put my faith in Him and I live faithful, friend, I've got intervention from on high. Jesus promised that He would pray for his followers. John 17, verse 20 and 21. The Scripture clearly says He is able to aid those who need help. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. God is able to keep those who stay true to Him. And on the final day, they will have a home in heaven with Almighty God. Now, we want to look at one last lesson in the book of Zephaniah, and it's this. There is a great joy in God's faithfulness that His people ought to have. I ought to rejoice in the faithfulness of Almighty God. It's, it's something I can truly trust in. Look in Zephaniah chapter 3, beginning in verses 14 and 15. The Scripture records for us in this passage, Sing, O daughter of Zion, Shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He's cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. Where's the encouragement in this book? Here it is. God says you can sing. You can rejoice. You can be happy. How? The faithful God has promised and it will come true. Your enemies will ultimately be defeated. Friend, that's a, a tone that you see throughout the book of Revelation as well. When God's people are being persecuted in the first century, when there's destruction, mayhem, chaos on every hand it looks like, God arises on His throne and promises the greatest enemies of that day will be destroyed and Christians will arise out of the ashes victorious as they always have. Put your trust in the faithfulness of God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Now that fourth short book in the Minor Prophets is known as the book of 
Haggai. Haggai is written during some of the post-exilic time, that is after they've come out of captivity, God's people have now been restored to their homeland and yet they've started building their houses, they've started rebuilding their own homes, trying to rebuild a sense of community and they forgot the main thing. The temple of God is lying in ruins, ruins while some of them are living very high in their own houses, Haggai will say. What's the major idea in the book of Haggai? Look at Haggai chapter 1. Verses 5 and 6, the scripture says, You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. Now watch this. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. Can you imagine that scene? Here you've got a, a bag, a jar, a wallet, and you're putting your money in there, and there's a hole in the bottom of it, and it's all falling out. That's the image here. God says, you're doing a lot. You're building, you're working, and, and none of it's for any good. Why? God will go on to say, because while you're up building your fancy houses, the house of the Lord is desolate. The house of the Lord lies in ruin still. And so some of the key words in Haggai are build and hope. Key phrase that you'll hear multiple times throughout the book is consider your ways. God says, stop and think about this. You're taking care of yourself. You're not building my house. And which ought to come first? Well, of course, God ought to come first in all things that we say and do. Now, some of the people thought they had some pretty good excuses for not building the house of God yet. They said in Haggai chapter 1 verse 2, it's not time yet to build the house of God. What, what do you mean it's not time? The Bible says now's the time. Today is the accepted day. There's a lot of people when we think about putting God first to say, one day I'm going to do that. One day there's going to be a day when everything's just right and I'll put God, wait a minute now, Today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1 and 2. Now's all I've got promised. James 4, verse number 14. Uh, as we think about why they weren't rebuilding, fear was keeping some of them from building the house of God. We learn in Haggai 2, verses 4 and 5 that although they'd been in captivity, they were let go from that, some of them are still afraid. Friend, fear still keeps people from putting trust in God like they ought to. Some people are afraid of the enemy. 1 Peter 5 verse 8, And no doubt we ought to have a healthy respect for the devil, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Some are afraid of, of failure. What if we don't do it? Wait a minute now. If we put trust in God, follow His will, we can't fail. Christians will be victorious in the end. You know what else was keeping some of them from building the house of God? Worldliness. Haggai 1 verse 4, they're so caught up in their own lives, their own houses, their own summer houses, and all the elaborate things they've got. The worldliness is keeping them from doing the work of God. I wonder how many folks today, worldliness is keeping from serving God. Do you remember James 4 verse 4? Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Do not love the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. Now, as we look a little further in the book of Haggai, Haggai mentions some things that are so practical for us that, that we've got to consider. And, and the first one is this. Here's such a practical lesson to consider. Number one, we've got to ask ourselves, are we really giving to the Lord as we should? God says in Haggai 1, verse 6, you're, you're giving but you're doing it second rate. You're putting in a bag with holes in it. You, you, yeah, you're coming up and making offerings and sacrifices. You're doing your tithing, but it's all falling out of the bottom of the bag. Why? Because God wasn't coming first. My friends, does God come first in our giving? Do we really give and be given to you? Luke 6, 36. Are we really giving joyfully and cheerfully? 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. Are we really giving attention and fulfilling the, the work of God's church as He wants to? Are, are we putting first things first and are we striving, really striving to be what God wants us to be? Now, let's think about this for just a moment. What is it 
like in the days of Haggai, what is it that motivates us to really stop? and pause and think about priorities and considering our ways. Well, no doubt, the blessings of God. The people in the book of Haggai long should have been thinking about God's blessings when He released them from captivity, when He brought them back to their homeland. They should have long been thinking about that. Same is true for us. Do you remember Ephesians 1 verse 3? Every spiritual blessing is ours in the heavenly places. What blessing is the Christian missing? All my physical needs are promised to be provided if I put God first. Matthew 6, I've been forgiven of all past sin. Hebrews 8, verse 12. I have the avenue of prayer where I can ask for God's help. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. I get a second chance to do it, uh, what I messed up before. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. And I can call upon God as Father. We ought to have a, a burning desire to really consider our ways and think about what's really right in the sight of God and put our trust and our hope in Him. You know, we ought to be motivated by the love of God and by the beauty of that place called heaven. Look at how much God loves me and you. God so loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And for the Christian, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Are we really striving every day to do what God wants us to do? Have we really considered our ways? Friend, we ask you to pause for just a moment from the rat race of life and from the hustle and bustle that we often get caught up in. Think about your own eternal destiny. Think about right now, where will you go when this life is over? If you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, we urge you, become a Christian. Put your trust in Jesus. Believe in Him. Be willing to repent of those things that are not right. C confess His name before men. And Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. May God help each of us to really stop, think about our ways, pause, reprioritize, and put first things first so as Paul we can say, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.